my name is Michael Crocta, and I am a Barks Forest Watch Coordinator. And I'm going to be giving a little intro uh, to the project and then uh, focusing later on on our uh, process of identifying beaver habitat in the field. But before we do that, I also want to um, introduce a couple other folks who are here right now. Um, Kyla and Misha, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourselves? Hi everyone, um, my name's Misha. I'm going to, I'm the Forest Watch Assistant. So I'll be out on the surveys with you all um, and I'll be helping coordinate those surveys. Uh, so you'll get some emails from me. Um, I'm also going to help moderate the Q&A during this. Um, so I've gone ahead and muted everyone. Um, we'll have two Q&A sessions, one in the middle of the training and one at the end. So if you wanna post any questions that you have in the chat, um, I will, write those down and respond to those. And then if you wanna talk during the Q&A, um, go ahead and remember to unmute yourself. And I'm Kyla Zarek. Um, I work as a wetland ecologist with the Institute for Natural Resources, at Portland State University. Um, I'll be talking about wetland identification and classification. And I just wanted to give you a few details of my background um, before we move on. Um, I've been working, I've been lucky that my professional and academic interests have intersected with wetlands since about 2010 when I started studying a tree species that grows in forest wetlands in southern Chile. That work continues today. But I started studying wetlands here in the U.S. working with the Montana Natural Heritage Program where I was a photo interpreter mapping wetlands as part of the National Wetland Inventory for three years and then also doing wetland condition assessments in the field. Here in Oregon with the Institute for Natural Resources I've been mainly office bound. And so I'm really excited for this collaboration with BARC to start to get out into wetlands here in Oregon, and especially to get into Mount Hood National Forest in the Clackamas District. Um, so thanks to all the folks at BARC, and thank you all for attending this. And I'm excited to get into the field with you. This is a, um, this project that we're doing, it's a, this is phase one in a multi-phase project, the Clackamas Wetlands Habitat Restoration Project. And basically what it does, um, it's a, it's a project to, to gauge the water storage capacity of individual wetlands in the Clackamas River Basin. And then we're going to be using that information along with BARC's ongoing habitat data collection efforts to then eventually design and implement some, some high impact restoration activities. And so you might ask, um, you know, this is, this is a little bit different than some, some projects that BARC has done in the past. And so, you know, why are, why are we focusing on wetlands now? Why are we focusing on, on beaver habitat? And so to sort of think about that a little bit together, I think it's good to think about climate change and sort of some of the, some of the implications that climate change has on the areas that we work in and the forest surrounding Mount Hood. So, you know, um, in the type of ecosystems that we work in and the Cascades, uh, some of the projected impacts of climate change that are, we're likely to uh, um, experience are, you know, both increased drought and also uh, increased flood events uh, in the forest. And so, you know, lower stream flows in the summertime, um, more drought in the summer. And then uh, during the rainy season, you know, water moving more quickly through the watersheds uh, during, during that rainy season. Uh, combined with uh, a projected decrease in snowpack. So, um, you know, less of that slow release of water into the ecosystems um, that have really adapted to that, that type of slow release. And even really the geology, um, you know, basalt um, can uh, store a lot of uh, water um, if it's slowly percolated into it. Um, but uh, just the ecosystem that we're in, it, it really isn't, um, it really isn't built for the type of um, fast moving water through it that, um, that we're projected to, to experience. Um, along with that, you know, increased wildfires, you know, while wildfire is a natural process um, that can be really beneficial to um, ecosystems, it does have the capacity to really alter them at an increase in scale. And so it's something that we're, we wanna stay mindful of. Um, you know, habitat loss also, especially endangered species. And so we're thinking here about you know, listed fish. Um, there's, with uh, rising stream temperatures and increased drought, 
um, that's really going to affect the connectivity that some of these species are, are going to be able to have and, and their dispersal capabilities and, uh, and life cycles. And so, you know, wetlands and, and beaver are pretty amazing at um, addressing some of these things, or they can be. So, and beaver especially are an amazing partner in improving wetland functionality. So, you know, thinking about what are the, some of the importance of wetlands. Um, and uh, so, you know, increasing, they can really increase that water quantity, increase water storage quality, um, the reliability. And, you know, we'll talk more about this, but beavers can really aid with this by damming up rivers, slowing down water, keeping wetlands wet. Uh, wetlands provide habitat for uh, wildlife, including many endangered species um, in our region. Uh, they can increase carbon storage on the landscape. So wetland soils are very high in carbon and they can also provide fire refugia for, for many species as well. And so like to illustrate that point, I like to show this video. I'm not sure how great the color shows up on people's screens, but there's this, um, this green part here in the middle. This is a, a photo of the Sharps fire in Idaho. And this was a, a beaver created wetland here that you can see provided a place where species could really carry over and persist after a, a pretty high severity fire that affected a lot of the surrounding landscape. And so looping back to, to our project, um, we have some of our, our overall project goals and activities here. Um, we want to, with the help of, of volunteers, um, update the wetland mapping in the Clackamas drainage where it's inaccurate or outdated. Um, and Kyla's gonna talk more about that. Um, we're going to identify site suitability um, at individual uh, areas in the Clackamas for, um, for beaver. And that's gonna include field data collection by volunteers. Um, we are going to estimate uh, water storage capacity of individual wetlands also through a mix of spatial modeling, and field verification and monitoring with help from volunteers and then the goal is to then take all of that information um, and then use it to prioritize some wetlands in the Clackamas for future restoration projects that are aimed at um, enhancing the capacity of wetlands to have a, a positive influence on water quality and, and quantity. Um, and so what that could look like are you know things, actions like planting native shrubs and trees, some large wood placements, artificial, artificial beaver dams or, or beaver dam analogs as they're often called, uh, and possibly even some uh, beaver, beaver relocation. So we'll, we'll get more into all of that. Um, the last thing I'll show here, this is, again, I'm not sure how great the color looks on your, your all screen, but this is a, a map showing sort of the two sub watersheds of the Clackamas that we'll be focusing on this summer. So this purple outlined area is the middle fork of the Clackamas. Um, if you can't see it, the Clackamas River runs kind of where my cursor is running right here um, through this middle part of the map into the city of Vesticata's water intake. And then the, the other area is the Oak Grove Fork of the Clackamas that is sort of centered around Timothy Lake here. Um, and all of these all these dots on this map are points that we've completed already some, some beaver habitat surveys uh, in 2019. And so those are some areas that we're likely gonna be returning to um, in addition to some more areas out there as well. So that's just kind of a overall kind of intro to, to this work and some of our goals. And so I think now I'm gonna just go ahead and pass it over to Kyla, who's gonna talk now a little bit more in depth about some of the aspects of wetlands that we're gonna be focusing on together. So take it away, Kyla. So as Michael mentioned, one of the goals of the project and our field work this summer is to verify that sites mapped as wetlands are indeed wetlands and that they've been classified as the correct wetland type. This is important in conjunction with the beaver habitat surveys because we need an accurate inventory of the wetlands on that good before we can plan any sort of restoration activities that will directly impact sites. For example, um, though we're ultimately interested in increased water storage, we may not want to permanently inundate a wetland that is right now functioning as a biodiverse wet meadow, especially if there are only a few wet meadows in our target watershed. 
In upcoming slides, I'll share some background information that will help you prepare to identify and classify wetlands in the field. Here are my three objectives. To define wetlands and discuss how they differ from riparian areas and deep water habitats with a focus on freshwater wetlands. To examine the three key distinguishing features of wetlands and to introduce um, wetland classification, especially the coordinate system. Let's start with the question, what is a wetland? When we think of wetlands, we often think of places with standing or ponded surface water. Some wetlands are indeed permanently or intermittently flooded, like cattail marshes, sicka spruce swamps, and others are characterized by water tables that are very close to the surface, like bogs. However, most wetlands are not permanently inundated, and may in fact be dry for much of the year, like forested bottomlands, vernal pools, or the wet meadow pictured here. How can we define wetlands if not by water presence? The answer is straightforward. According to the manual titled Classification of Wetlands and Deepwater Habitats in the U.S., there is no single, correct, indisputable, ecologically sound definition for wetlands, primarily because of the diversity of wetlands, and because the demarcation between dry and wet environments is dynamic and lies along a continuum of the gradient. This gradient of wetness can make wetland boundaries difficult to distinguish from other types of ecosystems. In general, we can think of wetlands as occupying transitional zones between terrestrial and aquatic environments, shown here on the left by well-drained uplands and on the right by permanently flooded deep water habitats. Like wetlands, riparian areas are also transitional zones. The boundaries that separate riparian areas from uplands or wetlands can be subtle. We can get a better understanding of those subtle or overlapping boundaries by zooming out to the landscape scale and looking at the landscape in profile. In the middle and lowest part of the landscape, we see a channel that represents the deep water habitat of a river. As we move away from the channel to the right, we encounter an area where wetland and riparian boundaries overlap. Likewise, if we start at the channel and move to the left, we encounter a riparian area that intersects with a depression in the landscape that's filled by a wetland. In general, the amount of, or duration of water tends to be less for riparian areas than for wetlands, and their vegetation communities tend to be dominated by different species. In contrast, riparian communities can often be quite similar to that of adjacent uplands, but riparian areas tend to be more robust or dense, and they may have a greater diversity of species. So getting back to wetlands, how do we know whether a site is a wetland? For ecological purposes, not regulatory or jurisdictional, we look for the presence of at least one of the three defining components of wetlands, water, hydric soils, and hydrophytic vegetation. We can do this both in the field and to some extent via aerial imagery um, and satellite imagery. In the next slides, we'll look at each of these components in turn, but keep in mind that they're interrelated. That's what makes wetlands so dynamic and interesting. To understand these ecosystems, you have to draw on information from the fields of hydrology, soil science, and plant community ecology, and think about the connections or feedbacks between them. When we talk about wetland hydrology, we're especially interested in the amount and pattern of water presence, because these factors determine whether a wetland is formed and maintained at a given site, as well as the type and functioning of that wetland. The term water regime is used to summarize the mountain pattern of water presence. A wetland's water regime is characterized by the depth, duration, frequency, diurnal fluctuation, and seasonal timing of groundwater and surface water. In other words, water regimes summarize when, how, and how often water arrives at the site, how deep that water gets, and how long it stays. The vernal pool showed in the photos on the left can be said to have a seasonal water regime. It fills with rainwater in the spring, dries out by the end of the summer, and again fills with rain in fall. The term hydroperiod is slightly more narrow than water regime. Hydroperiod refers to the length of time and portion of the year 
when a wetland holds water on its surface. Wetland plants and animals, such as pond breeding amphibians, are adapted to specific hydroperiods. So if this aspect of a wetland's hydrology changes, there will be cascading effects on its soil, vegetation, and animal communities. Now let's think about wetland hydrology in the context of fieldwork. How can we tell whether a site was recently inundated or saturated by water if no water is currently present? Or how can we tell how much of a site has been covered by water? The answer is that we can look for the following indicators or signs of wetland hydrology. For example, we can look for algal mats or crusts. These mats or crusts are of dried algae left on or near the soil surface after surface water recedes or evaporates. We can also look for iron deposits, thin orange or yellow crusts or gels of oxidized iron on the soil surface or in objects near the surface, like rocks, plant roots, or woody debris. Cracks in the soil surface are another indicator of recent inundation, but know that these are most likely to form in clayey soils. And the fourth indicator is water-stained leaves. These are fallen leaves or leaves that died in place, but have turned grayish or blackish in color due to inundation for long periods. And a final note, besides these visual clues of recent water presence, if you smell hydrogen sulfide or rotten egg as you walk across a site, it's a pretty good sign that the soil is currently or is recently saturated. Now let's turn to hydric soils. Hydric soils are defined as soils that are water saturated for extended periods of time during the growing season. Soils that are waterlogged will often demonstrate characteristics that distinguish them from non-hydric soils. In non-hydric soils, oxygen is trapped in the many pore spaces between soil particles. This oxygen is used by plants to carry out respiration, the metabolism of sugar to obtain energy. In hydric soils, however, this soil oxygen is rapidly depleted due to chemical and biological oxygen demands and anaerobic conditions result. This lack of oxygen has a number of effects on the biological and chemical processes in soil. For example, since plants need oxygen to carry out respiration, Anaerobic conditions persist for just a few weeks during the growing season, most upland plants will die. As discussed later, wetland plants have adapt adaptations that allow them to survive under the low oxygen and nutrient poor conditions of wetlands. So what do hydric soils look like? The photo on the left illustrates one characteristic of hydric soils, modeling. Modeling refers to the presence of different zones of color and texture within a soil sample. It's caused by periods of saturation. The photo on the right shows two types of organic soils. Organic soils developed in wetlands that are saturated year round and thus where rates of decay are very slow. Peat soils are a distinguishing characteristic of wetlands that we call mires, bogs, or peatlands. What about soils in the context of our food work? As you can see from the photo on the right, soil sampling can be quite an involved process. We don't expect you to be doing any soil sampling this summer as you work on wetland field verification. Instead, you'll use the indicators of wetland hydrology and wetland vegetation to figure out whether a site should be considered a wetland ecologically. But if you want to learn more, check out the NRCS technical report titled Field Indicators of Hydric Soils in the United States. Also, if anyone winds up in the field with me, I'd be happy give a demonstration of how to extract and describe soil profile. Moving on to hydrophytic vegetation. In addition to the criteria already described, wetlands are distinguishable from uplands by having an abundance of plants adapted to growing in wet soils. Wetland plants are hydrophytic or water loving and have adaptations that allow them to occupy saturated and aerobic soils. There are nearly 7,000 plant species in the U.S. that may occur in wetlands. Cattails, sedges, brushes, cordgrass, willows, mangroves, and peat mosses are some of the iconic examples. While non-wetland plants take in oxygen through the roots and distribute it to the stems and leaves, in saturated soils, wetland plants need to use other strategies. Having these adaptations allows wetland plants to survive Thrive and even outcompete other plants in these environments. 
Cattails, sedges, and rushes all have oxygen transporting structures in their stems. These specialized tissues are characterized by large air filled cavities that allow for the exchange of gases between plant tissues above and below the water. Other adaptations of hydrophytic plants include changes in growth form that maximize the amount of surface area exposed to air. These include adventitious roots, shallow roots, multiple stems, and roots close to the surface, like in cottonwoods and willows. Other plants have specialized nutrient capturing strategies. Carnivorous plants, such as pitcher plants and sundews, are particularly common in peatlands because acidic conditions limit the availability of nutrients. The ability to trap and digest insects provides a supplemental source of nitrogen. How can the vegetation of a site help you determine whether it's a wetland? For the purposes of wetland identification, plants are categorized according to their probability of occurring in wetland soils. Five widely used categories have been developed. Upland, facultative upland, facultative, facultative wet, and obligatory wet. Facultative upland plants can survive in uplands or wetlands, but they're more likely to be in uplands. Plants that are facultative are those that have about an equal probability of appearing in uplands or wetlands. Meanwhile, facultative wet plants are more likely to be in wetlands, and obligatory wet plants are found only in wetlands. In Oregon, there are almost 600 plant species that have fact wet or obligate status. You can use the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers website shown here or the USDA plants website to look up the wetland indicator status of a specific species. But what if I'm not a botanist? I highly recommend that you start paying attention to the plants that are dominant in the wetlands and other beaver sites that you visit. You could also start to study up on the types of plants and plant families that are commonly found in wetlands. For example, in terms of trees, get to know alders, spruces, lodgepole pine. For shrubs, learn to recognize sedges, willows, and bog laurel. And finally, get to know your graminoids. It's especially helpful to be able to distinguish sedges and rushes on the one hand from grasses on the other, since the former are commonly found in inundated environments, whereas only certain grass species can tolerate wet places. So that was our introduction to what wetlands are, and how to start to tease out whether you're in a wetland or in a field. Now we're going to turn to wetland classification. Just as there are a variety of wetland definitions to suit different purposes, from regulatory to inventory and assessment, so too are there a variety of different ways of classifying wetland ecosystems. These vary from classifications that are widely applicable across geographies to those that are specific to a given state or ecoregion. In addition, wetland classifications can be based on characteristics that encompass landscape position, to those that key in on the species of plants that define a wetland community. I'm going to spend some time talking about the coordinate classification system because this is the system I'll be using to map wetlands in the office. Thus, these are the wetland types that you'll be helping to ground truth in the field. I'll also point out where you can find information about the major wetland and riparian types in Oregon, as well as the specific wetland plant associations found in our state. The coordinate classification system is used by the National Wetland Inventory, a program of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and it's the standard classification system for wetland mapping across the U.S. The system was first developed in 1979 by Coordinate et al., and, with, and it was revised in 2013 by the Federal Geographic Data Committee. To date, National Wetland Inventory Mapping has been completed for most of the U.S., including Oregon. However, the majority of mapping in Oregon occurred in the 1980s or earlier. Thus, the NWI doesn't represent the number, type, or boundaries of wetlands remaining following development. In addition, the original NWI mapping was based on relatively low resolution based imagery, leading to mapping errors. This is why our project in wetland and beaver restoration includes the goal of updating the NWI mapping for our project area. As we talk about Coordin, keep in mind that this classification system was developed to map wetlands as well as deepwater habitat 
including streams, rivers, lakes, and reservoirs. And it now also includes riparian areas. As an overview, the Cordon Wetland Classification System first separates wetlands into systems, and then separates systems into subsystems, classes, and subclasses. Next, water regime and special modifiers are added, and a coding convention using letters and numbers is assigned to each mapped wetland. These letters and numbers describe the broad landscape context of the wetland, its, vegetative, its vegetation type, its water regime, and any natural or anthropogenic modifications to the wetland. First, Quartan, um, the Quartan system delineates six major systems, marine, estuarine, riverine, lacustrine, palustrine, and riparian. Today, we're going to focus in on the clustering system to help keep things simple, and also because the majority of the sites that BARC is targeting for fieldwork are clustering sites. Most clustering wetlands are non-tidal wetlands that are dominated by trees, shrubs, and persistent emergent vegetation, including graminoids and forbs. Here, the term emergent refers to herbaceous plants with erect stems that are rooted in a substrate, not free floating. Western wetlands also include those that are lacking vegetation, but in that case, they need to be less than 20 acres in size, and the deepest part of the wetland should be less than 2.5 meters at low water. Within Quarden, Western wetlands don't have subsystems, but there are classes and subclasses. Western classes include rock bottom, unconsolidated bottom, aquatic bed, unconsolidated shore, emergent, scrub shrub, and forested. Let's take a closer look at some of these. The first three classes are, are our ponds. They differ in terms of the nature of their substrates and the percent cover of their vegetation. Rock bottoms have substrates made up of at least 75% stones, boulders, or bedrock, and their vegetation cover is less than 30%. Unconsolidated bottoms are wetlands where mud, silt, gravel, or other fine particles cover at least 25% of the bottom and where vegetation cover is less than 30%. In contrast, aquatic beds have at least 30% vegetation cover growing on or below the water surface for most of the growing season. The clustering class unconsolidated shore often applies to the shoreline around ponds but it can also apply to some vernal pools as well as snowmelt depressions. Unconsolidated shores are characterized by having less than 75% cover of stones, boulders, or bedrock, and by less than 30% vegetation cover. Finally, our more familiar wetlands. These are dominated by emergence, shrubs, or trees. These quadrant classes are determined by the height of the tallest vegetation layer in each case, vegetation cover must be more than 30%. So for a cluster and emergent wetland, sedges, rushes, grasses, and or forbs need to form the tallest layer. Cluster and scrub shrub wetlands are those where the tallest vegetation is woody and less than 20 feet tall. And forested wetlands are dominated by woody vegetation greater than 20 feet tall. Only the emergent scrub shrub and forested wetlands have subclasses. These have to do with the persistence and structural form of a wetland's vegetation. For cluster and emergent wetlands, vegetation is considered persistent if the stems and leaves of the hydrophytic plants are evident all year long above the surface of the soil or water. But they're non-persistent if there's a dormant period when, when no sign of emergent vegetation. For scrub shrub and forested wetlands, Vegetation is characterized as either broad-leaved or needle-leaved, and deciduous or evergreen. Let's put together what we've learned so far about the Quartan classification system. Take a look at this cattail marsh. It's palustrine because it's non-tidal, dominated by emergent vegetation, and the area of open water is less than 20 acres. The class is emergent because the cattails are non-woody, they make up the tallest vegetation layer, and their cover is greater than 30%. The subclass is persistent because live or standing dead cattails will remain throughout the year. Now, something that I didn't mention before is that 
one wetland can have more than one coordinate code. If there are distinct zones that are at least 5% of the wetland area, then different quadrant codes can be applied to each zone. Usually, only systems, classes, and subclasses change for site. That is, usually a site is characterized by only one major system. So for this marsh, we can look at the area of open water with some vegetation scattered on or near the surface and call it an aquatic bed class. Thus, this wetland has the quadrant codes PEM1 and PAB. So far, we've looked at the parts of the quadrant classification system that capture a wetlands landscape context, whether it's clustering or associated with the river or lake, as well as the structure of vegetation. Well, we can also add water regime modifiers to represent a wetlands hydrology. These modifiers contain information about the duration and frequency of flooding in a wetland. The class of a wetland determines which water regimes may be applicable. I'm only displaying some of the wetland classes that we've talked about. For aquatic beds, water regimes may be classified as seasonally flooded, semi-permanently flooded, intermittently flooded, permanently flooded, and artificially flooded. There are even more options for emergent, scrub shrub, or forested wetlands. I don't want to spend time defining all of the water regimes right now. You can look at these up in the revised coordinate dog manual. Instead, we'll look at some more examples of how coordinate codes can be applied to different sites, this time using water regime modifiers. Let's go back to our cattail marsh. To determine which water regime applies to a site, we need to use the clues that we learned earlier about figuring out a wetland's hydrology. Here, focusing on the cattail or PEM1 zone of the site, we should consider the time of year when we're visiting. If it's July and we notice that there is already a little surface water under our feet as we move through the cattails, there's a good chance that the zone will dry up by the end of the summer. So for this part of the wetland, we'll add a C or seasonally flooded water regime modifier to our coordinate code. The PEM1C code tells us that this zone of the cluster and wetland is emergent, persistent, and seasonally flooded. What about the other zone? Given that the water level is already drawing down quite a bit in the cattails, the fact that the water in the aquatic bed is still at the top of the depression or channel makes me think that perhaps it's groundwater fed, and thus will stay that wet throughout much of the year. So I'm going to add an F or semi-permanently flooded modifier to the quadrant code for that zone. The PABF code Tells us, this, tells us that this portion of the clustered wetland is characterized by an aquatic bed that's semi-permanently flooded. Here's another site that's somewhat more complex. Like the last site, this one is clustered because the open body of water is less than 20 acres and less than 2.5 meters deep. But what about the classes and the rest? First, break it out into zones by vegetation and wetness. I see four different zones in this wetland. There's a zone of open water, a zone of orange graminoids along the shore, a zone of shrubs, and a zone of shorter green graminoids furthest from the water. The open water zone doesn't have any vegetation, and I'm going to assume that its substrate is mud or silt. So the class of this zone is unconsolidated bottom. Um, there's no subclass. For the water regime, I'm going to interpret the absence of vegetation as an indicator that it stays relatively deep for most of the year. So I'll choose the permanently flooded modifier. So the first zone is described as a PUBH, or palustrine, unconsolidated bottom, permanently flooded. Now for the zone of orange graminoids. The class is emergent. These are likely sedges or rushes and I'm guessing that they persist even as they die back, which we may be starting to see here. Also, given their location along the shore, which most likely gets seasonally inundated as waters in the pond rise, I'm going to give the zone a C water regime modifier. This zone gets a PEM1C coordinate code for palustrin, emergent, persistent, seasonally flooded. How about the other two zones? 
I'm not exactly sure of the species of shrubs that we're looking at in the photo, but let's pretend that they're willows because you're going to run into those in the field. Let's say that we walk around in these willows, but there's no standing water or evidence of recent inundation. However, we know that the willows are commonly found in wet places, and we see that the outermost zone is dominated by grasses that are much more vibrant than those in the uplands and the far shore. All of this suggests to me that the outer two zones were temporarily flooded during the growing season. So now we've determined that these zones get the coordinate codes PSS1A, clustering, scrub shrub, persistent, temporarily flooded, and PEM1A, clustering, emergent, persistent, temporarily flooded. Great, that was the introduction to the coordinate system. Now what? First, I encourage you to take a look at the coordinate manual to review the terms we talked about, and especially the definitions of the different water regimes. And if you want to learn more about the specific wetlands that we have here in Oregon, take a look at the wetlands page on the Oregon Explorer website. Here you'll find descriptions and keys to our major wetland and riparian types. These were updated and revised in 2017 by John Christie, who was the previous wetland ecologist at the Institute for Natural Resources. And that's what I have for you. Please share questions. All right, if anybody has any questions, um, you can share it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask. Um, for anything that's been discussed so far in the presentation. Um, one question was whether this is being recorded. Um, it is being recorded and after it's edited, um, it will be shared with everybody who participated. And I think it's also going on Bark's Facebook page. I have a question. Yeah. Hi, Kyla. It's hey there. Uh, so, your latest example, that pond that looked like it was in a bit of a basin. Yeah. Uh, how would topography be taken into account when we're thinking about which areas might be flooded or not? Yeah. Um, as you're suggesting, definitely want to think about what the topography is like. So especially if you can identify if whether the entire site represents a depression or whether there are certain portions of a site that are depression, so there's no outlet, um, you're gonna expect that area to be capturing more water. Um, so that's one example of where if I see a distinct vegetation zone along the edge of a pond, I'm figuring that hydrology of that zone is tightly related to um, the water in the pond. Um, whereas the water that reaches the, that had reached maybe those vibrant grasses furthest from the pond, that could be a combination of snow melt, rain, um, it could be groundwater, and it could also be seasonal inundation from the pond. I think in general, um, you know, some of this work that we do in wetlands uh, is best done experientially because as you get around to different sites, you get a feel um, mm -hmm. and the comparison for what's going on in these different places. And you see all these different scenarios. Um, it's a little bit more easy to interpret when you're on the ground rather than um, just looking at still photos. Okay, we have a couple questions in the chat. Um, first is from Janice, um, says, willows can be hard to distinguish. Do we need to know the different species or just ID a willow? I think to start, it's just great to be able to ID a willow. I think if you wanna get into the um, indicator status, you're gonna to want to know the species, but I think um, for our purposes right now, knowing that there are willows, and sort of knowing where they are related to any standing water, um, knowing whether they're just on the fringes of a site, that gives us a lot of clues as to what's going on in that site. 
What else? Um, the other question is from Audrey. Audrey asks, uh, how many times over the course of a year would you visit a site to determine things like how often it's inundated? Yeah. Um, I mean, ideally, I think, in my opinion, um, we would want to visit a site during the growing season, maybe especially in the beginning of a growing season, at the end of the growing season, um, to capture both like right after, well, as a site is more wet and both as it starts to dry out. Um, but really we can look at clues in the field. And then also we have like to, to help um, with the wetland mapping, we have some great imagery data from multiple years. And so um, if you really wanna get a, a feel for what's going on at a site, you can look at the um, NAEP imagery, which we had starting in at least 2009, and then every few years up until the present. And so you can see, and there, and there are always that imagery is um, it's aerial, aerial imagery and it's flown always, almost always in August. And so you can see year after year after year, um, how wet that particular site is. And that accounts for a little bit of the variation um, in wet versus drought years. Um, but I, ideally, if we can, we'd like to get back to a site multiple times in a season. For the purposes of verifying mapping, um, we're gonna go and probably just visit once. And we're gonna look for all these different clues and, and stick them together and make our best guess about um, the water regime, for example. Uh, Michael asks, uh, what are a few examples of indicators that you can only see by getting on the ground versus aerial imagery? Yeah, some of those small details, like looking for water-stained leaves, um, like smelling that hydrogen sulfide odor, things like that, um, really seeing species. Um, we can start to get at, with aerial imagery, we can look at shape of tree canopy and start to figure out is this deciduous, is it evergreen? We can do that pretty well, but um, depending on the quality of the imagery, depending on where shadows are, um, it's, it's just great to be on the ground. Um, Eric asks, how important is it to have the same persons visiting any particular site at different times of the season? Um, I mean, again, I think it's, it's pretty invaluable to have those repeat visits, but I don't think it's crucial. I think um, in terms of figuring out whether a site is a wetland, whether it could be suitable beaver habitat, um, I think we're okay with a single site visit by just one person. Um, but as someone who wants to promote good wetlands data across the state of Oregon, I definitely encourage you. Like if you have the time, if you can get out there and get to the same site, um, please do. And you know, beyond the data sheets that you'll have to work with, draw some observations, take lots of photos, um, create sort of a story about that site. That's all really valuable information, um, especially because we don't know what's gonna happen under, under climate change. So let's get some baseline data and some really good um, initial observations right now. Um, does anybody have any more questions? We can wait a couple of minutes and then um, we'll have another chance um, for questions at the end. But we do have another question from Janice. It says, it sounds like most of these surveys won't be along rivers. Yeah, I think um, eventually some of the mapping verification will involve some time along rivers or at least streams. But I think that the sites that are being, I'm not sure actually, maybe Michael can answer. It seemed to me when I've looked at um, some of the sites that mainly they've been in at clustering sites with maybe small channels running through, um, but not really cobble-based streams, rivers. But Michael? Yeah, I'd say that's that's mostly the case. Um, most of the sites that we identified, we'll talk more about this, but um, were through a, either a spatial analysis that 
for the most part excluded the main stem of um, like for instance like the the sub watersheds of the Clackamas River um, and yeah kind of kind of did focus on some of these types that, that Kyle was describing um, but I think yeah I think it's also important to sort of go into this without making any real big assumptions about what we end up find, finding out there because um, because we're kind of like pulling these these areas from various predictions of different variables that um, are sometimes kind of dynamic. Um, yeah, it's uh, you don't always know what you're going to get, and that's kind of the exciting part of it as well. And then um, we have one more question in the chat, and it looked like Brooke raised her hand or raised your hand. Um, so if you want to ask your question after this. Uh, Joanna first had the question from the chat says, can you please explain more about what work this data will impact? Yeah. Um, so in terms of the, so again, one of the main goals, one of the goals of the project is to update the wetland mapping. Um, so ultimately my hope is that um, I'm gonna map to the National Wetland Inventory Standard and that data is gonna get submitted to the big national database. And then when people are looking for spatial data, boundaries of wetlands for the state of Oregon, they'll be able to find those new polygons that are drawn. And so the field work in part is to help verify that the mapping that I do is correct. Um, and so it's part of this data quality control that happens um, that's ultimately contributing to this national data set. Um, and then in terms of the beaver habitat suitability analysis, um, it's also going to give us some information about the total number of different types of sites in our watersheds. And I think, again, that's just crucial to have um, as a basis before doing any sort of restoration projects. We always want to know what are we starting with before we start to change anything or to recommend any specific changes. So that's the other big contribution is what's out on the ground there now? And so what, what are we okay changing? Oh, yeah. So I just, I was wondering if you could give us the citation for that update to the coordin system. Yeah, I, um, I will make the slides available and, um, and we'll also connect folks to a folder on Google Drive that has a whole bunch of um, background resources about the National Wetland Inventory, about um, keys for the types of riparian and wetland systems here in Oregon, and a lot more, probably more than you might want, but it'll be up there. Great. Okay, that's all the time we have questions for now, um, but there will be another chance to ask questions at the end. Um, yeah. Thanks, Misha. Okay, so yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kyla, and thank you, Misha. I'm going to be now talking a little bit about the beaver habitat survey component of this project, um, talking a bit about the protocol that we're going to use and how volunteers can, can help us by filling out some, some habitat scorecards so we can rank uh, sites that we're looking at based on their suitability for, for beaver habitat and start to think about, you know, alongside some of the information that Kyle is talking about, you know, what are, what does this tell us about some of the potential restoration projects um, that could occur at some of these sites in the future? And um, I should say that I'm not going to get really, really deep into the weeds on the ecology or life cycle of beaver kind of on its own right here, but I think a lot of um, that stuff is going to sort of come up as we go over our, our survey approach. And um, yeah, on that note, this is a, an illustration that a member of BARC's outreach team made this summer that I think is good at showing beavers doing what they do best, which is chewing down trees and building dams to slow down water on the landscape and, and keep wetlands wet. So I um, thought I'd start with that slide. And um, so yeah, talking a little bit about oops, what to expect 
um, when folks are out doing this with us, we're going to be surveying in areas that, like I mentioned, we map based on either known uh, historic fever presence on the Clackamas drainage or based on a spatial analysis that was done using a GIS software. And so the maps that volunteers are going to be using in the field with us are um, going to open in a smartphone app that we use in all of our field work now. It's called Avenza. And so basically this allows us, um, allows the surveyor to track your path um, in the forest where there's no cell phone service, drop pins, attach photos at different points of interest. I imagine this could probably also be useful for, um, you know, classifying some of the wetland types and that kind of thing too. Um, and creating that baseline. So anyway, encourage people to download this app. Uh, and we have a tutorial on our website too about um, how, to, how to use it and, and share the data that you collect. So if you come out with us to do beaver habitat surveys, um, we are going to assign you and the folks that are in your group um, who you'll be socially distanced from, unless they're people who are um, in your immediate family or um, COVID kind of bubble. We'll talk more about that. Uh, we'll assign you to a site to explore and um, that's, on, that's gonna be on a map that you have. And so after walking that entire area, sort of uh, carefully and safely, everyone will be filling out these fairly straightforward habitat scorecards that include all the components of good beaver habitat. And so right now we're gonna kind of walk through this together and talk about you know, what, what is good beaver habitat and how, how is this gonna be reflected on the, on the scorecard that we use. And so the first thing that we're looking at, we wanna do an initial screening of the site that we're at. So we wanna know if the site um, if there's a if there could be a potential conflict that would prevent a long-term beaver colony or a family from establishing at that site. And so um, heavy human infrastructure is, is one of those one of those conflicts. So an exa some examples here being if there's a culvert that goes under a main road, um, Sometimes beavers see road crossings on streams as almost like perfectly constructed dams that they just need to like plug up one little hole and they can they can flood the whole area. And so that's that's actually what's happened here where there's a beaver that has sort of started to build across this culvert um, at Clackamas Lake. Um, this photo is also taken at, Cla at Clackamas Lake. This is just another example of a potential conflict where there's buildings, you know, any human infrastructure that is adjacent to an area to one of these wetlands. Um, if you're imagining that wetlands water um, cover increasing um, due to beavers building dams and flooding that area, that's that that could be a conflict. And so also established campgrounds. Here we have like a fire ring that's been flooded by some recent beaver activity. Um, so that's that's one type of conflict. Another type of conflict is we want to know if there is if there's an existing beaver or beaver colony that's um, that's already in the area. So this these are some photos. In, in case folks haven't seen this before, this is very characteristic beaver chew. It's what the, it's what a beaver chew looks like, and this is fresh beaver chew. So you can see that this is really light colored. Fresh. There's fresh wood chips that are kind of surrounding this um, this chewed down tree here, and the wood hasn't really faded in color, and the wood hasn't split yet. And so this was probably done within you know the past year, uh, which can indicate an existing beaver presence. And beavers are really territorial, and so it's just good information to know um, if you know if we're thinking later about is this would this be a place that beavers could possibly be reintroduced to. You don't really want to reintroduce a beaver to a place where there's already beaver present. And just to show people, this is an example of um, some not very fresh beaver chew, but still very characteristic here. Um, you can see the wood has, has started to split and really faded in color. And so this beaver chew is much older and would not indicate that there's a, a current um, beaver population at the site that you're looking at. 
So once, once we're done with that part, um, now begins the scoring part of the site. And um, so we want to know if there have been beavers that are, have been at the site in the past and kind of like what that looked like, what the extent of it was, since that can really indicate good habitat um, if we know that there are beavers using it before. So when um, the things that we're looking for are beaver chew, you know, some of the, some of this kind of stuff like um, chewed, chewed stumps, um, sticks that have that sort of like chew pattern on them, um, beaver dams, which we'll show some photos of what those look like, and then beaver lodges, which this is a beaver lodge that's on Trillium Lake. Um, and it's a pretty, pretty big long-term lodge. And so you can see it's made out of chewed up sticks and mud. Um, and so beavers create these lodges to, um, to live in year round and they have underwater entrances. That's why they're up against the water. Um, and it's why they flood the areas around them. Those underwater entrances and the lodges themselves are, are something that helps them keep safe from, from predation. So that's, that's one example of a lodge. There's a few other kinds of type, a few other types of lodges here. So this one here is kind of, it's utilizing some live trees and roots at the edge of a, a pond for some support. Um, and you know maybe wouldn't be quite as obvious at first as that that big iconic like dome lodge so that's another type and then a really common type of lodge especially at lower elevations is a bank lodge and so basically a, a lodge that's kind of like half dug into the side of a stream bank and fortified with sticks um, is another that's another example here on the right here's a these are a few other examples of beaver lodges kind of a dome dome style lodge. So this one's overgrown because the, the beaver hasn't been active there in a while. And then the one on the right here is really classically um, built on an island in the middle of a pond. And again, that's um, that sort of aids in um, helping, helping keep predators at bay by putting it out in this area that would be inaccessible to a, a terrestrial predator. And the, and the beaver would basically enter in the lodge from um, under the water. So, and then wanted to show what some dam types of dams look like. So this is kind of the classic small, kind of smaller to medium sized beaver dam here. Um, and again, you know, beavers create these dams so they can, they can flood the area that's, that's behind them, slow down that water. And because that provides cover for them, again, to uh, stay, stay safer from predation. And it also promotes the type of plant growth that they really depend on. So a lot of these like riparian hardwoods and other vegetation are, um, are plants that they depend on for both eating and also for building additional infrastructure. And so that's kind of like in a nutshell, there's other reasons too, but that's kind of like in a nutshell why they do this. And so you can see this one they built with, um, sort of smaller, smaller size branches, probably use some mud too. And so you can really see like the height, like this really like brings this water to a whole different height than the rest of like where the stream's running off. Um, you know, yeah, they can really come in different shapes and sizes. Um, on the right is a really, it's a pretty old and pretty large beaver dam that's near Little Crater Lake. That's, you know, it's overgrown because the beaver hasn't been active, but it's still functioning in that it's holding back a lot of water there. And then at the same site on the left, there's a much smaller beaver dam that's built across a, a smaller channel. It's probably only like a foot wide. So when we're assigning a score to this historic beaver use, um, all of these scores are gonna be on different scales. And so this one's between zero and 10. Um, you know, you would give it a zero if there was no sign of previous use. And then on the other side of the spectrum, if there's a lot of old dams and lodges and chew, you give it a 10 and kind of everything in between. Um, and I should say right now with these, with these scales, um, you can, when you're filling these out, you can give any, any number on this scale that's 
between, for example, 0, 5, and 10, you don't have to give it either a 0 or a 5 or a 10. Just to be clear about that. So um, some more wetland shrub photos here. So um, beavers' favorite food in our area that we're going to be working in this summer in the Clackamas is going to be willow. Um, and like Kyla said, it's not super necessary to know every species of willow, um, but to know what a willow looks like is going to be something that you're going to want to know. Um, and I've put some some images up here of uh, willow and then red alder here as well, which is, alder is like a secondary food for beavers. Um, and they eat a lot of other hardwoods uh, after that too. But for the purposes of this survey, all you really need to know are the alder and the willow. Oh, hold on just a second. Okay. So um, on our scorecard then we have the woody food score. So basically it's asking us here, are there willows, are there alders? Are they within 30 feet of the water, within 100 feet, within 300 feet? Are there thousands of stems, hundreds or dozens? You multiply that all together and that's where you get your, your woody food score for the site. And so along with the uh, woody food, beavers also need to have uh, fresh greens in the, in the spring and the summertime where they're at. And so there's a herbaceous food part of this form that talks about um, the percent cover of the site that you're looking at. So basically if there's no grasses or herbs on site, the site would get a zero um, and a three then would be you know over 50% cover, which it's really rare that these sites have, have no grasses or herbs. Usually there's at least over a 50% cover there. Um, on top of being an important food, wood is also um, used for building lodges and dams, so it's an important building material. And beavers typically use woody materials that are between one and six inches in diameter, typically for, for dam and lodge building, which you can kind of see here in this photo that was taken in, um, of a classic dome lodge in the, in the Clackamas. And so when you're doing the surveys, you're gonna wanna look around the area and see what's growing near the water. Um, it doesn't need to be the willow or the alder or hardwoods. It could be conifers too, since this, we're just talking about building material in this part. And so, you know, asking the question, are there thousands of, of growing stems, hundreds or dozens um, for that section? And then, so along with the, with the sticks and the woody materials, beavers use a lot of mud in their dam and lodge building, and they need to be able to excavate um, to build out their ponds as well. And so we ask on the scorecard, what is the stream substrate, the dominant stream substrate? And so you can usually see to the bottom of the stream or the pond that you're looking at, or you can also probe it with a stick if you can't see to the bottom and sort of find out what that what that dominant substrate is. And so if it's rock, um, that's you're going to get the lowest score, zero. Um, sand or cobble, you get a little bit of a better score there. They can work with that a little bit more. But really, we're looking for this like silt and clay and mud, which is going to be the best substrate for, for the excavations and the building to be able to happen in the best way possible. And yeah, there yesterday, Actually, Misha and I found a pretty large dam in the Clackamas that seemed to be pretty dominated. Like most of it was built up just with mud. Um, so it's, it can be a really important building material when, uh, when other building materials aren't available. So like I said earlier, um, so beavers use pools to take cover from predators like cougars, for example, um, that don't like getting in the water. And so they, if there's no existing pools on site, then that can, that can leave beavers really vulnerable, um, especially if you're looking at a site for something like doing a beaver reintroduction. Um, it, can, it can also tell you, you know, if there's, if there's no pools present that, um, and you want beavers on site that, you know, you can start to think a little bit about how do you get those pools there. So 
with our water cover part here, um, there's a scale of zero being no pools, um, 10 being multiple pools up to three feet deep and 30 feet wide, um, which uh, there's an example of, of this here. And this is uh, back behind the, an old beaver lodge on the Clackamas. So the floodplain that you're looking at can influence how much water can be dammed up by a beaver. Um, and for this, it's really better to have a wider floodplain so more flooding can occur over a large area. So like this example here, there's kind of a meandering stream that goes through this really flat, um, this really flat meadow ecosystem where you can imagine it, it wouldn't take a whole lot you, you know, if, if this was dammed up to overtop some of this vegetation and really increase the amount of water cover that's in this area here. And so that's, that's really the kind of thing that we like to see um, are these kind of wide, flat, adjacent floodplains as opposed to a low scoring, sort of narrow and steep, kind of more V-shaped stream channel where um, typically with that, you know, the water is moving through quicker it's harder to dam up and you're not gonna get as much water behind um, a dam on a really uh, steeper floodplain like that. So a couple more aspects here. Um, so we, in the field, we measure slope of all of our sites using a tool called a clinometer. And we also use this when we're um, doing our, our timber sale monitoring too. So if folks have done this, it's the, it's the same tool that we use there. And so with this, generally the gentler the slope, the easier it's gonna be for a beaver to dam up a stream and, um, and hold water back in that area. And so to measure slope, what we do, um, and I have a clinometer here in case you uh, haven't seen it. Um, this one's broken, but typically um, there's a little bubble right here at the top, that's where the light comes through. So you wanna make sure that's facing up and then put your, put your eye, one of your eyes against this and look through and keep both of your eyes open um, is how you get that set up. And you're gonna wanna, with a buddy who is, um, who you're doing this with, walk down the stream and sort of stand parallel to the way the stream's flowing at, a few different intervals. We do this three times at three separate 30 foot intervals on the stream. Um, and then basically, yeah, you just, you look at what would be eye level to you um, if you were standing flat on the other person. So if the other person's about the same height, you would, you would line this up and look through it and, and then line up what you see, which is gonna be this crosshair right here with their eye and if they're a little bit taller than you you might want to line it up on their chin or on their mouth or something but yeah you keep both eyes open you get this crosshair overlapping on on whatever would be eye level and then there's going to be these two scales that appear that sort of superimpose on that on that person and the scale that's on the right hand side um i'm assuming you all can see my cursor i guess but um that's the percent the percent gradient. And so when you do that a few times and you average it out, you're gonna look at the stream gradient part of your form. Um, if it's over 9% on average, you're gonna give that site a zero. That's just, a, it's a little bit too steep for what we're really trying to prioritize here. Um, we're really kind of wanting to go for this like under, you know, at or under 3% gradient is where we're gonna get the most uh, water that's going to be able to get backed up. And typically most of these sites that we see are not going to be um, over 9%, but um, it's good It's good to have that, that information. So last thing here, um, the discharge. Stream discharge is, it's basically the, the water that's moving through the site um, that you're looking at. So to gauge this, you're gonna wanna walk all the way around your wetland site and find where the water is coming in and where it's leaving. So, um, you know, the, the inflow and the outflow. 
And that's also a, a good way to find if there's a, an existing beaver dam is, um, is seeing where that, that inflow is because it might be that a, that a beaver dam is, is uh, at that site and, um, and backing, up the, backing up the water. From, yeah. Um, so if, if thinking about this, you know, if there's, if there's too little water moving through, there's not gonna be water to dam up. And if there's too much, the dam might not be able to hold it back. So that's kind of what this bell-shaped curve here represents. So if you know if there's an intermittent flow, you know less than a garden hose um, or no flow, that's going to be a pretty low score here. Um, and then if there's a destructive flow that you know would inhibit damming, like if you can't really imagine being able to wade across the stream without getting swept away, that's a destructive flow. That's also going to get a pretty low score. And then if you get a, um, a year-round flow that's you know not destructive, that's kind of between like what you could imagine going through like a 10-inch to a 30-inch pipe, um, that's going to be kind of the, a really good amount of uh, discharge to be coming in there. And so that's so that's kind of like going through the whole scoring process. Um, but I also just want to say, like, all, you know, all these com things combined, they're going to give you they're going to give you a score. But I think it's also really important to remember that a lower score doesn't necessarily mean the site is good or bad, or that you know, a low score doesn't mean that the site won't be able to be restored. Um, we're going to be looking at all these scorecards and the results, and um, you know, depending on sort of what the missing link is for good habitat. And sort of how that interacts with some of the the wetland data that we also collect. Um, that's that's where we're going to be sort of forming some of these recommendations for different restoration techniques. So, for example, if a site scored really low for food, that might be a good place to focus on recommending some some willow transplanting. Um, or like if there's if there's not very much good building material, you know, planting planting some native shrubs there, and then if it has a lot of these other components, but there's not good water cover, then you know that's a really good um, a good place for maybe thinking about doing some some wood placements or some um, building some beaver dam analogs, so like artificial beaver dams, kind of like starter dams, just to get things kind of primed. So if a beaver were to inhabit that area, they would be able to more easily build up a dam and stop up that water and create the amount of cover that they would need to be able to stay safe from predators. So anyway, that's kind of that's kind of my my caveat with the scoring is that um, the score does a bad a low score doesn't mean that we're walking away from that particular site necessarily. Um, so yeah that that was kind of a lot. So yeah I'm done I'm done for now. If we we can do the Q and A. Okay, um, first question was, how large of an area should we include when considering the score of vegetation and suitability? Yeah, so that's a good question. So when um, every, every group is gonna have sort of their site delineated on a map. And when they are um, approaching their site, it's a good idea to walk as much of that as they can. Um, you know, basically what they would consider um, an area that's, that's influenced by, by that stream and that wetland um, up, into where, up to where it becomes forested, basically. But where you're, the spot that you're actually wanting to do your score is, um, you know, you want to choose the location based on where's, where's the deepest and widest water, what's the greatest amount of like good substrate, you know, the flattest terrain, the greatest amount of beaver structures, and the greatest amount of hardwood trees, you know, food, food and building material is where you're going to want to concentrate that. Um, because, you know, that's that, that within your wetland site is going to be where it's going to be the most likely that um, beavers are either going to be inhabited or we can do some kind of restoration work. So hopefully that answers that question. 
Um, and Russ said they had some observations to add. Yeah. Hello. Uh, so I have some observations from uh, some of my wetland and stream work. Uh, one is that I've seen a number of sites where bank lodges had no uh, wood on the surface associated with them. So it was just strictly right into the stream bank. Uh, so you won't necessarily find wood sometimes if it's an older site that uh, hasn't been used for a while. Some of those uh, underground lodges have actually caved in and you'll maybe see a hole in the ground, which uh, brings me to a, a safety tip I would add. If you have uh, trekking poles or an old ski pole or uh, a favorite walking stick, those are very useful when you're working around uh, wetlands because you're not always going to be able to judge very well how deep the water is and uh, you don't want to go in too far and if you're uh, wearing knee-high boots uh, you don't want to get deeper than your knee-high boots unless it's a pretty warm day. Um, vegetation wise a couple of other things I would mention uh, you might not necessarily see beaver chew but if you're looking in uh, standing water or running water you might see places where there's going to be debris from willow limbs floating you know that have been cut and used as food recently and also on some sites i've seen places where you'll see what looks like a path where the beavers have gone back and forth through the herbaceous vegetation and it's been kind of trampled down, you know, the same way it might look like if a bunch of us walked back and forth numerous times. Uh, let me see if I hit anything else. Oh, yeah, a tip on a clinometer. Um, the first couple of times you're not necessarily going to remember which side of that two-sided scale is the percent. So if you just tilt the clinometer way up or way down, uh, when you get to the end of the scale, you'll see whether it's the percent or degrees. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Uh, so that's a good way to refresh your memory. And I do that at the start of each season with my Clino. I think that was all I had to add. Thank you. Thank you. If anybody didn't catch that, Michael did a like all the way up and all the way down with the clonometer. Um, All right, any other questions you can type in the chat or um, unmute yourself and ask. Michael, might there be any opportunities for us to uh, go out just in smaller groups? Uh, or do you want to initially at least have it be larger groups, somewhat larger groups as kind of a training part of this uh, exercise? Yeah, I think they, they probably will be mostly smaller groups. Um, we, yeah, we are, we are operating under some kind of COVID informed safety protocols, uh, you know, which, which means that, you know, namely we're not really able to carpool or put people who, you know, have just met each other that aren't kind of in that same bubble in a carpool together. Um, and so likely, it'll likely be that the groups will be somewhat smaller than usual, um, but each group, I should say, you know, we're going to make sure that each, each group that goes out is going to have somebody who has done this before, who feels comfortable doing it. So we can make sure that, you know, folks that are just getting started are going to be kind of like um, getting, getting sent off in the right direction and whatnot. And, you know, when you're, when you're in your different groups, it's, um, one thing I forgot to say is it's it's good to kind of like assign roles to each other. You know, you could have one person who's like the, the scribe who is paying attention to the things that are on the data sheet and sort of asking guiding questions to folks. 
making sure that the scorecard's all the way filled out. Um, someone who's like tracking yourself um, on the map using a Venza or a paper map. <clears throat> And then, you know, some, and, and also, you know, if they're using a Venza, taking photos, and uh, dropping pins and stuff like that. And then, you know, the remainder of the group, if there are more people, um, can generally be, you know, taking measurement, measuring slope, um, paying attention to how uh, close some of the riparian vegetation is, you know, taking measurements if need be. Um, but uh, yeah, so everyone, everyone can have a role, even if it's a pretty small group. Okay, we got a bunch of questions. Um, so on the topic of groups, um, one question was how will volunteers be put into groups and assigned to sites? Yeah, so yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about this in the next step, but um, the way that folks are going to get sort of placed into groups, again, with the, we're going to prioritize putting people in groups together that are you know either um, you know it's a good time to get your housemates or your family members involved to do this I should say <laughs> just because of the like you know hard times regarding carpooling so those folks you know if you go out with them they'll definitely be in your group because that'll that's going to be a good opportunity there um, and then yeah like I said we'll we'll have at least one person with each group that is familiar and has done these protocols before. And typically like those groups will be sort of divvied up at the beginning of the day um, when people initially meet up uh, on the way out to the field. And, um, you know, leading up to that, everyone will say this again, but you know, everyone who participates in this, we're trying to get everyone's emails. And so you'll get put on an email list and be able to sign up for, for different field days. And so you'll be able to see who's, who's signed up for those as well when you, when you um, get on that. Yeah, and in that initial meetup, we'll talk about experience and comfort levels. Um, so we can work out those groups then so that everybody feels comfortable. Um, another question was, when do we start? Um, Let's see, when do, when do we, uh, July when do we start, 15th Misha? Is the first, <laughs> July 15th is the first uh, survey date. Um, so yeah, we'll send out an email with all of the dates that we have. Um, and some of you, if you're signed up for Ground Truthing, already got those dates today. Um, so yeah, July 15th, that's a Wednesday. And then we have an overnight this month too. So we'll do a two day survey, um, July 25th to 26th. Should be fun. Um, another question is how can one tell if, beaver lo if a beaver lodge has been abandoned? Yeah. I think, yeah, that can be tricky sometimes, but I usually look at um, some of the things like Russ mentioned, when you see like really freshly chewed willow stems or other hardwood stems that are lying around, beavers are sort of constantly maintaining their lodges and dams. And so a good clue there is if you see freshly chewed wood that's lying around or has been incorporated into some of the, the building. Um, and then one other thing that Russ mentioned too, um, that's a really good clue. If you do see, you know, something like, I think Russ um, described it as it kind of looks like a person was like walking back and forth a whole bunch of times, like the fresh beaver trails, fresh, fresh beaver excavations, um, fresh mud, sort of like things that are kind of common sense, um, but when you see them holistically, um, that can, it can paint a really good picture of whether or not a beaver is there on site. But it can, it can be tricky sometimes um, to know. So um, yeah, it, it can take a little bit of, of experience and, uh, and uh, using your best judgment. Um. So another question is, I have heard a beaver colony requires 18 to 20 acres of willow slash alder dominant riparian area to sustain itself. Is this accurate? I don't know if I could, I don't know. <laughs> That's a pretty specific number. I'm not sure. 
that's a good thing to I'll note that to to look that up. Um, and if anybody else has any more questions, um, yeah, go ahead and type them in the chat. Unmute yourself and you can ask. Uh, the overnight is uh, a weekend. It's July 25th through 26th. Um, but you'll get more information about that too in the email. Hmm. Um, you can just send your questions. So the question was, I have a lot of questions. Can I just send them in an email? Um, Yes, you can, um, definitely. Uh, I missed the first hour of training. How can I get a copy of the recording? Um, we'll send out a copy of the recording once it's edited to everyone who attended. And then was the petition successful? Oh, okay, so I think that's, that's referring to the beaver trapping band on federal land, I think. Um. Yes. Yeah. Let's see. I see that Holly is here. Um, Holly, is that a question that you feel comfortable answering? I know that you were trying to get to that meeting and I wasn't able to actually get to it live. Mary said that they basically tabled oh. it. Yeah, so it sounded like they tabled it because the legal department seemed to think that they actually weren't um, capable of making that decision. I, I plan to follow up with MDFW on that. I actually know one of the commissioners quite well. Um, but, you know, it sounded like legal weighed in and said that they weren't, um, they weren't uh, capable of voting on that topic. But even if they had, it's pretty clear if they were able to, um, the vote would have been no. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. But what was encouraging to me is that the consensus was I think 60 or maybe 70 people submitted testimony. I'd say 85 to 90% were pro beaver. Um, and even the trappers seem to be under the impression that we need more beaver on the land, but that the trapping really, at least according to ODFW's numbers, they only take 1,500 beavers on the federal land. Of course, we don't know what happens on private land, but according to them, and I do believe this is true, according to the testimony that I heard from a variety of parties, the bigger obstacle to beavers is that there aren't enough suitable habitat areas because of the way that we've been planting conifers in places that historically they had occupied that would have been willow dominant. And everyone on the committee agreed that beavers are such an important topic that they want to restart the beaver working group and really try to tackle the issue from a more holistic point of view. Um, so that was encouraging. The other thing that was encouraging is they got more written testimony on this topic than any topic in their history. They got almost 1800 pages of written testimony. That doesn't count the letters. So I was pretty bummed that they didn't vote, but at the end of the day, I feel like um, inroads were made and the consensus is that Beaver's important. I think the key is gonna be applying pressure to ODFW to not just sit around and talk about it. Um, so that's, and I, you know, I took notes on it. I could go into more detail, but I learned a lot listening to testimony and they had people submitting comments from as far away as Tennessee. 
I mean, this really garnered a lot of attention. So encouraging, but not the outcome we wanted. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that update, Holly. I, um, yeah, that was, that was really helpful. I saw that the commission um, put out a press release talking about this and, and saying that, you know, they thought this was an important topic and they were gonna discuss it more, but it seemed like the thing that they were really focusing on with that for some reason was the trap checking requirement. Like how oh. often they trap they, they check the traps, which I know people provided testimony about that, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't really the main rest of the thing. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And as far as I could tell, I mean, the meeting went on after my computer died, um, but they, there were two parts to it to change the trap check requirements. But so 35 states require that you check your traps every 24 hours. We are way out of line. You can leave a trap in for a week. It's just so inhumane. It is so cruel. And a lot of animal cruelty organizations, the Humane Society and other organizations chimed in. And again, the commissioners all agreed that, that that's problematic. But as far as I could tell, no changes were made. How soon could beaver be relocated to new sites? Something like that, I believe, since it's on federal land, there are some um, wetland-related restoration um, actions that can happen outside of the Forest Service conducting a full environmental analysis. And so I know, for example, um, doing things like riparian plantings and even some wood placements, they can, they can get those approved pretty fast. But I know that the for to relocate a beaver, you know, there's there's multiple agencies involved, and um, so ODF and W, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, has a permit process that um, is fairly bureaucratic. That um, you know, the the Forest Service needs to be able to, you know, establish communication with them and demonstrate that you know why it's a good idea and that there's no existing beavers on site. Um, and then they need to actually be able to source that beaver from somewhere as well um, after that permit process is complete. And typically those beavers are gonna be sourced from you know, more low-lying areas um, and they're, they're typically gonna be beavers that have been categorized as, as nuisance or, or problem beavers. Um, but also nowadays they, they don't, typically reintroduce beavers like just single beavers they like to do them in pairs because um, you want to you want to make sure you are establishing a breeding a breeding pair and a, you know a, a viable beaver population um, and so you know the time that it takes to be able to to pair up a couple of beavers also takes some time and um, in Oregon right now there's also like the the issue of how, like finding a hold a good holding facility, um, and right right now the Oregon Zoo is partnering with some other organizations to try to get a beaver holding facility up at the zoo um, that can then be the source for for beaver reintroduction projects that that happen, including up on federal land. But that hasn't Michael, been established yet. Can I chime in there? Mm -hmm. um, when I mentioned that to Sarah, you know, the woman who made Beaver Believers, she said that the way Washington has done it, it's way more makeshift, low budget, that it's really easy to find places to sequester them and sex them and make sure they're healthy. <laughs> and that there's no need to wait for Metro and Zoo and all their bureaucratic process to come up with an official holding facility. She said she could talk to us, but Washington has done it way more low budget, do it yourself, very successfully. Yeah, I know a lot of times they've just used whatever the nearest fish hatchery is. As, or even, you know. even, even simpler than that. So that should not be an obstacle for us, but 
I guess my question for you is, you know, I'm really disappointed that the ban on trapping didn't get passed because I felt like that was going to make the beaver introduction on Mount Hood way more likely to succeed. Do we have any options for getting protections for the beavers on Mount Hood so that we don't end up getting them all trapped out? Yeah, I think that I think that that would be a good thing to focus on. And I know that um, for whatever reason, the the trapping regulations vary. They vary from county to county on the same national forest sometimes. So actually in Clackamas County, I found out uh, on Mount Hood National Forest that beaver trapping is, is not allowed. But then on Wasco County and Hood River County, Multnomah County, it is. Um, so I know some national forests, like I think maybe the Sayus Law have actually banned beaver trapping like forest wide. And so it could like, you know, and something, a uh, strategy that we could pursue is trying to get um, uh, a trapping ban just across the forest. And then I feel like the way that the Forest Service really likes to see examples of how things were done in other places because it's like somebody's gone through all the bureaucratic hurdles already and they can just point to it and say that's how you, you know that's how you do it so if we could you know if we could start that process here I think that would be great. Do you think we could get that for the whole Mount Hood National Forest area? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we could ask Suzanne Fowdy how they did that for the Sayus Law. Yeah, I think that would be a good idea. Great, yeah. I just feel like if we don't have something in place, we're really in a precarious position with any beavers we relocate. Yeah, Mary mentioned that they know a beaver colony uh, near the Willamette River in West Lynn that the landowner wants to be removed. Um, and they asked if trapping numbers are available for Mount Hood. I'm not sure about the trapping numbers for Mount Hood specifically. That, that's another question I, I'll write down right now. I know the trapping trapping numbers. I think by county. They're tracked by they're tracked by county. I, I think so. Okay. But I'm not sure. So I'm I'm writing I'm noting that as a, a question that I don't know the answer to. Do you know of um? any relocation um for a beaver an unwanted beaver colony is that um what, mary is your question are we aware of any unwanted co colonies i i am aware of one <laughs> oh you know of a colony that needs to get relocated yes um, urgently? The last time I talked to the guy, he said he's gonna trap them out if he can't find an option. Does he realize that there's mitigation that would let him coexist? I'll talk to him again. I mean, it's, it's problematic because he's adjacent to some, there's a lot of, the wetland extends to it areas that he doesn't own or have any ability to control, so. Okay, well, my understanding from talking to Jacob Shockey is that you end up spending way more money trapping out the beavers and then new ones come in, you trap those out. And yeah. for, for about $1,500, you can get um, a non-lethal, things set in place that will usually permanently solve the problem. So he says that it's just, you know, that's the biggest misconception is that if you trap them out, you'll be free of your problems. I'll talk to him again. Okay. 
Yeah, and you know, I'm sure you could reach out to Jacob too about ideas about ways to talk to him. Okay. Or you could reach out to me and I'll reach out to Jacob, but hopefully he won't do anything rash. Hopefully not. Hopefully not. <laughs> um, so I think we're gonna, uh, let's see. We're gonna wrap up with a few logistics and then I think Kyla has one last thing to say. Yeah, well, I was just going to point out that um, in terms of making political arguments for why we want to tr ban trapping and relocate beavers is this idea of what's changed over time. And so with the updated NWI mapping, um, which will capture uh, beaver sites, so there's a modifier that's added to sites if there, you can see evidence of beaver activity from aerial imagery and usually you can, you can either see lodges or you can see dams or you see this ponding that's indicative of beaver activity. Anyway, that updated mapping, we can count the number of beaver sites in a project area and compare that to the number of sites that um, are in the old mapping from like the 80s. And I think that would be really telling as to, yeah, how many, how that number has changed. Totally. Yeah, thanks for that. And um, yeah, so we only have a, a few minutes left. I just wanted to um, just cover a couple more logistics and then probably wrap things up. Um, so Holly and Mary and a few other folks who are on this um, workshop right now um, are part of a and Kyla and I and uh, Pavlina, a few other folks um, are all part of a, a group that meets uh, every, we decided every first Wednesday. So today is included in that. Um, and if folks are interested in kind of delving deeper into some of these topics uh, related to, you know, wetlands and, and beaver management, um, it's a really good group um, with some, with a lot of different perspectives coming to the table. Um, and not just in the Portland area too, there's, there's people from other parts of Oregon that, that attend. Um, and so, yeah, we typically meet over Zoom nowadays uh, from, you know, around this time at six o'clock every, every first Wednesday of each month. And so if people are interested in that, um, oh yeah, I should put this next slide up because it has some contact information on there. Um, definitely get in touch. And another thing I was, gonna say you know we covered a lot of information tonight and I would just say to folks like if some of this stuff feels like really new and like daunting um, just you know not to not to worry too much like we're we're making a commitment to really find a place for you to contribute and make sure that you're feeling like prepared and supported um, so uh, you know just to review you know some of the things that we're gonna be needing some help with the summer, you know, the beaver scorecards, um, involving field work, that wetland verification out in the field. Um, Kyla, I think, is going to need some help with the uh, building and installing and checking the water depth uh, monitoring wells. I don't know if you want to say anything about that real quick. Sure. Um... My hope is to install 14 water table monitoring wells. So um, 14 different sites. And these are mainly PVC tubes with caps on them. Um, but um, there is some material to haul around and then some, um, just be great to have an extra, have some extra hands on board um, to help carry things, to help, um, even excavate the holes, um, et cetera. So if you're interested in some of that manual labor um, and, and also just learning a bit about water table monitoring, um, please sign up to join me. Great. And yeah, like I said, we're gonna, we'll be providing, you know, direction and support if you'd like to help us with these things. Um, and like I said, we're, we're trying to, you know, get, record all the emails of the people that came to this talk, but just in case we miss you or 
maybe you're watching this later, like watching the recording or something. I put an email here, um, and Misha is checking this email. Um, just the forest watch at bark hyphen out.org. Um, send send a message to that email if you're if you're interested in coming out with us and doing surveys and um, we'll get you on an email list. You can sign up for volunteer days. I will say, you know, just just so you know, this this kind of work, it does likely involve some hiking off trail, possibly getting some some wet feet at times, hopefully not, but it's a uh, it's really, really fun. I think you're really going to like it. Um, and uh, yeah, and again, like I said before, we are operating under safety protocols um, related to COVID. So, you know, that mostly involves things like keeping, keeping distance, um, you know, a lot of intentionality around any kind of sharing of any equipment, um, making sure that things are sanitized. Um, less carpooling, really like trying to focus on getting folks grouped with um, with family members or people that you're already exposed to. It's a really good time for that. Um, but, I, you know, it's also a really important time for, for folks to be able to, to get out and participate in stuff like this. So I'm excited to, that we're going to do our part and try to make that happen. But, um, and that's kind of it. I don't know if Misha or Kyla, if you have anything else you want to mention before we close out. Michael, can I can I add one more comment directed to Mary? Yeah. So at one of the meetings in the fall, Esteban told us that he was getting permitted to start doing non-lethal mitigation. So I think Mary might be gone, but I'll reach out to her if she doesn't chime in, that he might be the first person to talk to about ways to discuss the beaver problem with her, her neighbor or that person. Great, yeah, that's great. Yeah, and uh, for folks who don't know Esteban, Esteban's someone that we've been working with, um, especially on the spatial analysis and identifying beaver habitat using, using GIS software this year. Who's also done, yeah, a lot of a lot of beaver-related work in Westland. So that's good to hear. And uh, yeah, I'll just say um, people have mentioned a lot of different resources. Kyla earlier mentioned there's going to be like a shared Google folder, Google Drive folder, where there's going to be a lot of resources related to wetland classification um, and a lot of other documents that we're kind of referencing there. And so. When we follow up with people um, who have participated in this, we'll make sure to, to link that to folks and, and make sure that's shared with you too. So, um, yeah, if you want to make sure that you get that um, or just want to reach out about any old thing, just make sure to send us an email to this forest watch at bark hyphen out. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm super excited to go survey these wetlands with everybody. Um, and if any of this seemed, yeah, overwhelming or new, um, yeah, we'll make sure that the first few times you're out there, you're out there with somebody who can help show you um, anything that you're not familiar with. So we'll send out more resources. Yeah, I'll just say a quick thanks to you. Great to see faces, great to hear voices, and hope to see you out there. <laughs>